at DE, you can learn more. Here in the Virtual Chaos Studio Hamburg, I am meeting Manuel Eituk, alias Honkhase, who uh, will give us the highly interesting uh, talk about war in the Ukraine, bombs instead of cyber, or is the cyberspace itself a warscape? This talk will also be transmitted on the internet. Dear radio listeners, you may also be interested in the following um, Moin Moin in the Chaos Studio Hamburg on day two of DVOC 2022, Bridging Bubbles. This talk. For those of you who would like an English translation, please go to the bottom line of this video frame that are you looking at us right now. There is a menu item to choose your preferred language. The item is called native and it's located to the left of a menu item to adjust the volume. If you have any questions, uh, there are multiple possibilities for you to post them. In the announcement of this talk, you will find a link to the Q&A pad for questions and answers where you can put your questions. Maybe you want to change into the edit mode before writing. The hashtag for Twitter and Mastodon and also the link for IRC you can find in this video frame in the tab chat. Our signal angels will then find the appropriate tweets and questions for the talk. And then at the end of the talk, the speaker can answer them. Manuel Atuk is, uh, has a, a, um, a cybersecurity professional and uh, IT professional. He is known in hacker circles as Honkhase. Since over 23 years, he is involved with IT security and concerns himself with Kritis, which is uh, hacking back and ethics and uh, protecting from catastrophes. Honkhase is the speaker for the AG Kritis involved with critical infrastructure. He is currently in Egypt, which is why we will firstly uh, play a video and then he will be connected live and uh, answer your questions from the pad. Hello, all together. Welcome at Divok Bridging Bubbles for the third time as the replacement for Easter Hag. Today we will talk about Putin's war in Ukraine, the bombs instead of cyber. I will give you a small overview of cyber war and critical infrastructure and protecting civilians in wartime. Now, I'm of course not a professional and expert for war, but the cyber part and critical infrastructure part and protecting civilians is uh, something that I do here and there and uh, will ideally <laughs> start professionally annoyed with these um, bunny ears. So, this uh, cyber war was uh, announced a lot with uh, the sabotage of uh, civil infrastructure as a, a military operation, but maybe cyber war and uh, critical infrastructure will be cybered away, uh, even in Germany, apparently. But maybe what do we actually see in this war? The BMI are saying that there are massive cyber attacks and then maybe that's there's also there's some website defacements some ddos attacks some data leaks this and that but actual tactical focused and persistent um, takedowns of uh, water or communication systems or blackouts not really but the Khazad attack maybe can be seen as collateral damage and it had the, uh, the result of lots of satellites being um, not uh, active and many wind power um, plants were not able to be maintained properly anymore. So what else is used for these kinds of modems? Yeah, the Ukrainian government and their police, which was the attack uh, goal in this case and were taken out for a few hours. 
What else was involved? RWE2. The, um, the, the fleet management of, uh, for example, firefighters and THW in Germany, and especially the, the traffic control of all of these. The satellite uplinks um, that are the, the same, using the same satellite uplinks in combat areas uh, has become a bit of a problem because suddenly there was no communication available anymore. It was just uh, taken away. The result of this didn't really stick around for long, but uh, the damages stuck for a while. Uh, the wind power plants were out of order for a while not just in Germany, but out of also in other countries. But what else can we see from this massive cyber war, in air quotes, that uh, can be seen in colorful PowerPoint slides from consultants to the military, and many of those mostly male, that often maybe uh, provide their IT security solutions as the ultimate way for all of the nations to cyber each other away. That can't really be seen anywhere. Just like some straw being blown over a street. But we can see that uh, water plants, water reclamation plants in Ukraine are disabled and power supplies not being guaranteed. All of these PowerPoint slides that maybe show the coming cyber war haven't really so shown what can actually be sh seen now. All of these slides promise everything and anything, a bit like scamming or phishing. And why is it like that? Well, because as a, an old, white, uh, responsible person, it sounds am amazing that if you don't really know the entire cyberspace, also here, mostly males involved. So what would a persistent attack on critical infrastructure actually look like? Well, Stuxnet basically showed this in 2010 with the uh, uh, uranium um, enrichment centers and the, you can actually attack SCADA components of industrial um, plants and that did require a lot of research and uh, a lot of resources from the US and Israel and um, also some Dutch research scientists that were introduced as spies there. And also you had to rebuild the original factory building one to one. And that also might be something <laughs> where Putin brings uh, his personal uh, lead hexers on horses. And the same thing where maybe you can create more pressure and uh, disable safety systems and increase pressure in, in gas pipes if maybe there is a mechanical overpressure safety valves there, then there can't be any cyber attack. Just one one pressure uh, let off valve can prevent this. And so yeah, so there might be some offensive, but there's nothing but collateral damage. And there are some Pots of Steel awards that could be given, but all of these people that prevent this, they are not really well known. So now a, a long-standing failure of critical infrastructure, this is improbable, but all of this collateral damage can't really be considered in um, risk analysis, and uh, therefore it's easier to not take them into account. But that, of course, is only possible with a small um, system that can be easily um, considered. But with entire populations, these collateral damages that can happen, that was, of course, calculated as risk. 
But we are not living in Hollywood, where you maybe type around for five minutes on a keyboard and then the progress bar does the hacking. But with long, prolonged failures of critical infrastructure, um, that is where, where this stops. And all of this kind of stuff, the digitalization of this kind of infrastructure is coming, and it's coming soon. And it actually makes sense, because with the automation, with lots of these processes, more people can be um, supplied. And just because all of this maybe, maybe has gotten less expensive, more people can be supplied. And that means less people have to think about and uh, worry about a lack of water. We have, even in Germany, people that live at or below the minimum existential uh, income. So, well, let's say the unlikely, um, the unlikely case of a um, lack of pressure is actually taking place. Like, Putin is not delivering gas anymore. Let, let's just think about it. It's, it doesn't seem likely, but... So, even though Germany um, is not really... Uh, the critical infrastructure in Germany is not really a good goal for Putin, especially because... not just because uh, all of this uh, collateral damage that might happen, um, Putin might actually have to bring the data packets himself because lots of Germany isn't even connected properly any, at all. But what kind of critical infrastructure in Germany is actually relevant here? What, what, what kind of critical infrastructure? Well, if tomorrow there is still power and water for everyone, if, if not, what, what's then? If the, the power doesn't care if it gets cybered away. In this case, um, with critical infrastructure, well, let's look at the ATA train. To, until 2025, you, we will probably need to restore the train, train tra the tracks there. So what do we need? Do we need to hack back for vengeance? Well, please, let's not. I don't want to see these slides. But what do we actually need? Well, we um, need some information from the BSI and the BBK. And so we need the combination of physical and cyber resilience. We need a, a resilience of IT infrastructure against all forms of attacks and threats. So, in that case, all of this prevention, um, because it's not just all of the hacks from the hackers and pen tests and hackbacks and cyber cyber. No, we don't need that. Please continue <laughs> on these four slides, you can't see anything. So why is the cyber space no war place? Well, yeah, it is. It, but just like war always was, information warfare as hybrid warfare, propaganda, fake news, spy, spy fare, that's uh, warfare now in cyber, like it always was. It's old tactics that just happen in our common cyberspace now. Yeah, there's just this one cyberspace. Conventional war with weapons and rockets and bombs in Ukraine might mean that his uh, kinetic weapons only hit the Ukraine and Ukrainians have to come here, uh, have to flee while we are 200 kilometers away and drink our coffee. Some, something else happened as well. We are always getting information from Ukraine. It doesn't happen in silence. The world can only watch like this. 
critical infrastructure like that it is also being able to watch but we also have to learn to live and work with propaganda and that's a very very critical chapter we'll have to live with and learn to handle it's not that simple and how all those participating state actors non-state actors who are they we have militarily we have cyber combatants we have secret services we have hackers and apparently some of the hackers are working together with the armies critical infrastructure part of the state government we have um, science in there civil societies in there there are civilists there are teenagers who are not quite developed morally yeah we have people who just want to destroy but we have hacker collectives like anonymous you see it's a very colorful field but do we have any defenses and what would they look like well powerpoint slides are not it hexor offensives cyber war that doesn't help us what's left yeah the rabbit gets boring again backups and proper it security processes boring things like the boring thing bsi basic protection everybody wants security but nobody wants to create it everybody wants a backup but nobody wants to make it there's engineers and IT security experts, properly educated administrators, computer emergency response teams, all these people. But those who help the ones back up if they drop. And with FOSS.org or on the CCC cert, we need more resilience, cyber resilience. And yeah, it's possible. So let's do the boring IT security. What, what, what else would we need? Well, well, randomly, our random number generator says four again. So the THW we already have, which is a German group for um, catastrophe protection. But we would need, we have a concept three, uh, from three years ago, and the CCC helped with this, and thanks again for the great input. So we have concept for three years, and it was published 2020. So the concept is two years, uh, five years old now. So civic society could help with the reaction. And there is a lot of know-how with industry um, machines and all that. And the society, civic society can really help out. And scientists, also pensionists, who have a lot of know-how because they have been working for years and decades. So much unused potential, untapped potential is out there. And yeah, those groups, they ask to help. And people want security. Know-how is there. Everything is there. We could secure everything. So we can be preventative secure and able to react quickly. The coalition contract in, from 2021 also had this. But everyone is waiting for others to do something. Someone else to start it, yeah. We have to leave hackbacks B and proactively start hardening our hardware and software processes. Yeah, I am done. Thanks for listening. Have fun with the following talks.
to stop. See you soon. Lieber Honkhase. Dear Honkhase, thank you very much for your talk that we just heard and saw. You are listening to Radio Darmstadt, though if you can hear this, you are hearing the translation right from the internet. But right now there is a lot of information for those listening via radio. As you know, this is the DIVOC Bridging Bubbles. And there's the website di.voc.de. There's more information. The speaker is in Egypt and now he is here live to answer some questions in our Q&A. If you want to ask a question, you can find a link to the pad in our schedule. Johan Kase, welcome. And hello to Egypt. So you are at the pool, but you just had a talk. And when you think about the talk, it's, it's scary. I have a first question for you. So other than the bad internet connection in Germany, how can we create more resiliency, more media competence and more learned cyber competence in our civic society? So not just within some agencies, but modern spy agencies 2.0. Well, hello first, and uh, thank you for this uh, very big question, which is a lot about uh, cyber competence and cyber security and even uh, espionage uh, 2.0. So it's uh, maybe even four questions. So um, let's uh, get to how do we get more resilience? Um, it's not like just pressing one, pass <laughs> one button or activating an AI or a blockchain somewhere and uh, ta-da. But um, one has to think a lot about the, the core question, as I already said in the talk. What uh, are really the, the threats for the critical infrastructure? How can we properly answer the question, will there be power and water in the pipes tomorrow? If we have to say no, because there is some sort of threat, then we have to really also think about the scenario, what are the measures against that, uh, what are the most likely ones to actually take place, and uh, what are the, the very easy solutions that we can have for it. Um, maybe the, the pressure release valve I mentioned. So we, we can't just talk about um, the, the hackbacks or maybe cyber uh, vengeance attacks. Uh, to, that really doesn't fix the, the water or power supply. That's just a, a thing for that. Resiliency is, is before that. Resilience is defense. Um, I, I, I always like to say parenthesis, uh, cyber uh, defense, a resiliency. And this is uh, something where you can get by, to say very easily, um, to, to write the, the base requirements uh, and uh, integrate them into the system to have this base resilience against the, the standard attack. And that is something where one has to also look in at how you can find further measures um, to become this bit more, more resilience. And every bit more resilience also usually means more stability in the supply for the population. And now get now let's get to media competency. So how can we can we get there? Um, I have already talked a lot lot about this, and I can do it again. So for decades now, um, we have uh, said media competency can can't just be created. It has has to be strewn across the population, and it can't only happen in college. It uh, should happen earlier in, in school, maybe or, or even in kindergarten. And so 
kids uh, really have to be introduced at the mo earliest post point. What does it mean to be on the internet? What does it mean to do research? What is IT? What is IT research and IT security? How do you um, use algorithms and data structures? If people would learn that now, maybe people are confronted with autonomous cars now, or uh, let's say lethal autonomous weapon systems, um, maybe even actual AI and uh, questions concerned with that and uh, that's where like we currently are with machine learning and uh, not really uh, mostly statistical ai but um, this is something that we really would need to do with uh, media competency and media literacy uh, give me a second i need to do something here um, so the third part of the question was learned cybersecurity. Yeah, well, you, you talked about cybersecurity, and uh, not just uh, malware, but also um, espionage uh, 2.0, basically, which is not just uh, maybe not reinvented in uh, the cyberspace, but um, the, the the same techniques in some ways. So if we uh, come to espionage, there is. Um, something that um, a high military uh, officer from the Netherlands said, uh, well, digital espionage is, uh, of course, uh, very easy and very normal. And uh, maybe even it's uh, something that uh, it even happened a lot in uh, the Democratic uh, German Republic, the DDR, East Germany. And um, there was a lot of um, uh, fake news and uh, that was distributed and um, there you you can't just only um, tap one telephone but you have to actually write on everything maybe you you uh, log everything even encrypted connections so maybe you can uh, decrypt them later and uh, also stuff like that so if it comes to cyber war and all of the possibilities involved with that for espionage uh, it really becomes a, a sort of wild west of cyber espionage and uh, it's it's really become way too big and way too ubiquitous that is definitely something that we have to do we can see that in the ukraine war as well a lot of espionage and cyber warf warfare we we have information warfare not really cyber war but we have uh, deep fakes we have fake news we have um, something that really worries me is that even the Ukrainians aren't really working cleanly anymore. They say that they have like uh, thousands of soldiers um, with uh, face recognition, um, recognized with the face recognition from Clearview. Um, yeah, the, the truth was really hard to find and it's never been more up to date than now. And yeah, that is something that really like for example finding the the mothers of um the the captured russian soldiers stuff like that and that is definitely information warfare and psychological warfare um that uh, is are definitely methods coming from espionage and um this underground warfare and um there are lots of different um things that we have to think about uh, there's of course di di diplomacy that has to be done a lot and also, there's uh, the, the cyber piece uh, Decepticon, um, which is a sort of um, cyber digital uh, arms control, maybe. Um, how much um, the espionage is happening and how much warfare is happening and stuff like that. Okay, and maybe so. Are we, and I'm talking about Germany now, are we even able to to resist or to survive if we see the po options or possibilities or the capabilities of Russian or American Chinese cyber attacks? Hackback sounds good, but maybe not realistic. So, well, that might sound sort of good, but um, maybe also only on the colorful PowerPoint slides um, by from the um, consultants. But um, it, it, you can usually say that an attack on a foreign system um, can never be really done without um, certain guarantees. Uh, you, you can't really say that there's uh, 
control all the way. That is always suggested, but it's not really true. It's a, it's a bit like this this Nigeria scam, um, but it, it sounds way too nice. But yeah, that's what it is. In 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 truth, we need other capabilities. We need to uncover these kinds of attacks. We need to um, steer against them, and um, that's that's where we get back to resiliency. If you have resilient systems that are resistant against these kinds of attacks, then nothing really can happen. And um, but of course, the Germans are also very active in espionage. And uh, for example, the BND is uh, allowed to hack uh, foreign communication providers and ISPs. I, I find it hard to be happy about that. Okay, ne next question is addressing this as well. So it's let's get to the next to question. So what are the concrete ideas we have? So in the GDPR, it's very open and neutral. Um, maybe we want to have more concrete options here. Can we allow ourselves to be this open? Yes, yes, we have to, and we, we uh, under all second, some circumstances. Um, so, in 2019, I started with my uh, worldwide con consulting on these kinds of things, and uh, I, I recognized that all of the things that were said were really vague and uh, not very clear. But um, there's, of course, a, a bad solution to this, which is for. Um, all of the people that have uh, this um, that that don't know a lot about um, media competency, and um, the, we have to define what are the goals, what what do we actually want to reach, what kinds of me measures are, do make sense, and um, what has to be changed in all of these systems because it's always a mix for the the threat scenario. Because maybe um, if a certain scenario can't happen, then it, it doesn't really make sense to invest in different things. Uh, because then the money goes into things that you don't even really need instead of the things you do. So you always have to keep this path open of what exactly do you do against the, the concrete threat that you're trying to protect, protect against. And it, it isn't bad to not really know these things uh, beforehand, but discovering these things, um, that is a, a big part. And uh, many of these uh, systems in critical infrastructure are very complicated of um, big systems that are very closely integrated between switches and relays and lots of um, subcontractors here and there. You can't just say that we're, we're taking the infrastructure offline. Like, yeah. We, it, it's not easily possible. How do you want to take a, a, a power system offline or a communication system? It, how, how are they supposed to be, the, the frequencies, how they're supposed to be kept up? We, we do need that in, in like a high-level scenario. We need to define the goals of uh, what needs to be achieved. Okay, to try it differently. Are we maybe really naive? I'm an, in as an immune system. Well, we're not just naive, we're also kind of incompetent. So if, if we look at the, the kinds of military uh, involvement and um, what uh, some of them are doing, if we really consider what the German government did uh, for years, uh, for example, uh, Mr. Seehofer, um, I, there are things where a face palm isn't enough. So uh, it's, it's kind of bad slapstick. But uh, that is basically how they see the world, and they actually uh, mean the things they they do seriously. And now we, we need to teach these people uh, how to treat these things. So the next question fits. Are there any things we can do against a targeted cyber attack that is going further than what we have to do anyway to circumvent nature catastrophes and big accidents? So maybe we uh, don't really need to talk about this all the way, but um, I will refer back um, to the, the threats and um, that are involved. So I have to look at the threats from afar, and then I have to decide what actions I take. So there's, there's a lot of overlap uh, of uh, the, the, the steps to take, the, the resiliency things that can be done that are also very good for 
stability and uh, maybe also help with sustainability. But uh, of course, that um, doesn't really help if my, my backup is uh, really old and uh, I can't properly restore it. So either I have a, a measure that I really considered a lot and uh, implemented properly, or I maybe I have a solution that doesn't really work. And uh, a bad solution, unfortunately, is uh, not a solution. Um, we have lots and lots of bad solutions, and uh, that's our problem. So the solutions exist, we have to take them. Well, there is the joke when people just laugh it away. <laughs> you, you can't hack my water line back home, but yeah, the municipal water supply, you can be hacked maybe. So can you maybe illustrate the difference between short, middle and long term? Uh, blackouts. Yeah, so uh, what we have seen a lot was um, short-term shutdowns. So maybe there was a DDoS attack here or there against the website uh, or another. And um, so, yeah, those were just switched over or something and that's it. So that's basically something that interests no one. It's um, really bad if this kind of stuff happens against critical infrastructure. But, um, and then this, uh, because if it's just the small stuff, it can be compensated for easily. But if we have um, larger attacks, then that is more like uh, stuff that is also persistent. And it can also produce uh, stress in certain scenarios that um, involves um, maybe um, both of these scenarios as well. Maybe there won't be water for an hour or maybe just like brown soup because the pipes were damaged. Uh, so, um, for these long-term persistent things, because, for example, if we have blackouts and uh, power loss, then uh, because the, these kinds of blackouts take a long time and it's also uh, uh, maybe in, in a big area, a big region, maybe even uh, countrywide, and then you often have damages that are cascading between uh, different components. So uh, with power, for example, it, it doesn't just stop with power, because if the power fails, then maybe also the, the water pumps fail, because water pumps use power and the and the diesel generators that are the backup generators are also sometimes empty. So, for example, we have like 15,000 gas stations. How many of them have backups? Well, like uh, power backups, maybe 150. So, after like two or three days um, with a lack of diesel, the, something like a water power might not run anymore. And then we have a power and a uh, water loss. But then, of course, maybe you can fix the water, the, the power thing, and then you can just uh, turn on the power uh, for the pump again. But, of course, uh, as soon as the water stands, you have to, um, there is bacterial growth, and then you have to uh, run the water for at least two weeks before you can use it again. So the, the water is contaminated now. And this is something where maybe like a, a big bakery, there's like factory level bakeries, then maybe like um, they they are uh, collecting them. Maybe if you buy your buy your bread from a local bakery, that's easy. But the the uh, maybe their hospital has a problem or something. But uh, the, and but the the big uh, factories have lots and lots and lots of uh, dough that they're processing, and then they can't cool it for a while. Maybe and then you need months months until you have the dough processing back up to the levels that need to be there. That's li like these production cycles are a big problem. So, for example, also chemical processes as well. It takes really long to be up to operational speeds. And those kinds of things can actually have do proper damage. So cyber physical uh, attacks uh, that are attacking actual um, physical things where basically the only example is Stuxnet because of all of the other ones failed because um, it, like uh, actually making an attack persistent in a way that um, can keep this up is really difficult. Okay, so Using hackback and thinking further, I got the question, 
how do others protect, other countries protect themselves? Could we maybe copy their resilience? Maybe not copy, but learn from them? How are others protecting themselves? Well, yes, we, we can. And um, there is an institution that is uh, supposed to prevent these kinds of catastrophes in Germany. Um, like uh, protection against catastrophes in general is usually a bit of a different thing. But um, let's uh, think about a different topic. Let's uh, say um, getting food to the population, maybe during a, a blackout or something. Um, in Germany, we have um, uh, mostly reduced all of the storage spaces um, to an on-demand system. And uh, so the way individual people can do something about this is very, very small. So ask some sort of neighbor, maybe, where, where's the next emergency water distribution point? And in Germany, nobody knows. It's, it's really bad. Um, if you ask somebody in, in Turkey, maybe, they can tell you it's down there, maybe that pump, but if you want the good water, it's uh, somewhere else, maybe. There's a really good um, uh, pump there for water. And they just always have 20 to 30 liters of water ready for them, just in case. And in Germany, that's not really the case. And in Germany, we really reduce the, the distribution for these kinds of things. In other countries, you usually say that um, maybe we need to provide more storage space at the discounters maybe uh, and the, the supermarkets and they just um, store more um, food than they would usually do just just in case but then the, but then the, the government says that it has a primary uh, priority access to this kind of storage and um, can distribute it so there's there's nothing you have to like lose or um, or uh, waste, but uh, so yeah, all of these concepts are there, but they aren't really applied in Germany at all. Yeah, probably there was also a lot of redundancy that was reduced, probably for efficiency. When I think of ISDN or voice over IP because it wasn't worth it to run it at the same time for cost reasons so not only between people it became more that people talk to each other but also between company uh, countries and yeah we need more redundancies you were talking about storage space, but all of the systems need to be more in parallel because I think the DHW has more of these than police, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, redundancy is very good for redundancy. Um, we don't really need to think about all of this in a capitalist uh efficiency maximization point of view but we can also say that maybe we really want this 10 or 20 percent um, backup and um, this kind of le level of redundancy needs to be maintained and maybe also inspected um, because this kind of redundancy is definitely something um, that these kinds of uh, resiliency are needed in these kinds of cases um, we to to have it and to not need it is really bad. To need it and to not have it is really really bad. And yeah, the uh, politics will have to adjust it as well, because the marketplace cannot handle this on their own, and politics has to use their uh, and create those mechanisms to create redundancy. And if it's worth it to recreate it, I think that's interesting. So, yeah, let's. Uh, I want to say one thing for that. At least there is now a, a new government that is maybe considering some of these things, because uh, for a long time there was absolutely no chance. So, uh, I, I do have a bit of hope. Well, that's that's a nice statement. I have a last question. I'll just read it. Do you think that the new version of Industroyer? In Destroyer, if that also will roam in Germany, will it also get out of Ukraine? Do you know that, In Destroyer? Well, you, In Destroyer um, was a thing, I think, six years ago, and uh, In Destroyer 2, uh, which is the new thing that's making the rounds, 
uh, was analyzed and uh, that also was a cyber physical attack uh, on the power supply um, and that was also something that didn't succeed um, also something where the cyber war slide junkies uh, really um, spread the scam but uh, the actual actually producing a blackout is really really difficult i think the new version well it, it's it's basically already through and gone it's, it's been analyzed and yes there was an attack but you can of course re reverse engineer parts of that and uh, maybe uh, misuse that uh, against german systems and uh, that is something that the secret services are probably going to uh, research a lot and look into it and uh, probably uh, use in their stockpiles of weapons, of digital weapons. But um, that is something that we know since uh, Snowden, where everybody was shocked for a while, and then everybody else so thought, yeah, well, we want to do the same, instead of thinking that, well, that has to be dismantled. So that is, I think, definitely something that the Industrial or Industrial 2 and uh, this kinds of um, software is definitely supposed to do this kinds of thing and will probably in, at some point also be used against Germany and um, distribute itself, which is uh, which we already have seen with NotPetya as well, which was an attack against uh, only a specific country, but then spread around the world and uh, really um, uh, got out of control. And uh, because, yeah, the, the attackers can't really be determined beforehand. That's what I'm trying to explain all the time because like you, you the, this kind of risk assessment is really hard to do because you can't really um, calculate the threat uh, because yeah we can't just uh, retaliate with uh, cyber attacks so yeah industrial and uh, such things will come to germany we uh, have a of course the possibility to have um, something that uh, maybe the uh, my company Agricritis, um can say that is like if the shit does hit the fan, uh, which is not really a question of if but rather uh, when. So yeah, um, then we have to be prepared and we we can say that we have the the thw and we have the the uh, firefighters and everything and all of them can uh, cooperate it and the cooperative and organize together do a cyber physical attack maybe and um, prevent it and uh, also uh, mitigate the results because if if the attack was coordinated uh, in in such a way then maybe the um response also needs to be coordinated maybe uh, actually like the the thw the the catastrophe response needs to actually go where the attack happened and fix things even on a digital level maybe similar to abc weapons so atomic biological chemically maybe we need d for digital and maybe the danger is that if we leave it out like biological weapons that it just becomes part of nature in science fiction there are nanites that data just barely got back is there maybe a real danger like this that a digital weapon already got out and is waiting out there to reawaken well I don't really think so, uh, maybe for the sci-fi authors, but um, that's something uh, something that we do have to think about, uh, defining digital weapons and um, thinking about what that means, and also maybe whether digital weapons are actually weapons in the sense of uh, conventional weapons, and um, also like, for example, the, the hoarding of uh, zero-day exploits um, it can be equated to a, a weapon locker, um, and it, which, which is something that the CIA did. Uh, so that is something where the the, for example, with these kinds of um, whistleblowers, this weapon locker was emptied. Um, so the question is, who else can do this uh, when even they, with their big budget, couldn't do it? Uh, so back to like cyber policing and cyber war so this this kind of uh, weapons control is needed uh, and uh, more research need to be done into like what is the the proper storage of these kinds of weapons for example and 
that is really we're basically at the first step of uh, like back when uh, atomic weapons first came up where some people said like we, we have to regulate it and uh, some people were saying like it's impossible to regulate but no we did like um, and we have actually brought a couple of um, in insane governments to um, take down a bunch of nuclear weapons and that that's a good start and that's where we also need to arrive with digital weapons as well Okay, so maybe we should destroy digital weapons. Okay, thank you very, very much for this scarily interesting talk. And thank you for doing this from Egypt. We hear some live from your holiday and how your holiday is calling for you. And yeah, I want to close with a small but very intense thank you to all the angels.